Good morning. I hope y'all all are doing well today. I hope you have come prepared to just praise the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you understand soon and very soon he's coming back. It's a limited time. It's just a limited time to work these fields now, y'all. We got to do what God's called us to do. As we begin today on inside of your bulletin, look inside your bulletin. Uh, we are still taking up the state missions for Margaret Lack, and uh, that's right here in Mississippi. It helps with our BSUs. I don't know if you realize it or not, but all around you have BSUs, Baptist Student Unions, that help deliver the message of Jesus Christ and give our young people a chance uh, to be around other Christians and where they can feel encouraged. Uh, if you can support that. We also have our, it, it supports also all programs in the state of Mississippi, all programs, including mission churches in the state of Mississippi are, are helped through the Margaret Lackey program. It's not just something to take up money. It's not just something to get from you. It's an investment into your community and your state in the name of Jesus. Also, you'll see on here the nursing home ministry. We're also collecting up uh, for the the, uh, the Christmas shoe box. We're still collecting for that. How's that going, Hannah Sue? Uh, we're actually in one here today and kind of organizing to see what we've got or what we need. Okay, so we're still taking up for that. Uh, if you can help in that, uh, get with Hannah. She knows all about it. It'll be a wonderful blessing there. Also, uh, we, we also have something to do with Team Kids. Somebody want to get up and stay, say something about Team Kids? Team Kids. Shout. Shout. Amen. Amen. Okay. Is there anything else? What am I forgetting, Miss Carolyn? Anything? Yes. So in the back, so we passed out last week uh, a form for deacons. We're looking that the Lord would bring us three deacons. In the back, up on that little small table right there next to the sound booth, is qualifications for a deacon. It goes back in the history of this church. You could pick up one of those. I'm hoping, Lord willing, by next week, we can pass out a piece of paper where you can write at least three names on that piece of paper where we can get it back, right? I want you to pray. I want you to seek the Lord's face, and we're just going to go with, with how the Lord leads us on this, and it, it gives you all the qualifications back there. Anything else? Senior safety, there on, on the back table is also a, a form for senior safety uh, that you've been invited to, and that's going to be at the, the sheriff's office, isn't it? It's going to be at the sheriff's office, and then it'll be a chance for you to hear some information. It's a key thing, because I don't know if you realize it or not, there's a lot of scams that go on all the time, lots and lots of scams that they uh, try to attempt to uh, get to our uh, senior adults. And I know through the years, I had someone that they were called, uh, they – and not here, this was at another church, and they told them that their grandchild, this was after high school graduation, they said your grandchild uh, went into Mexico, they're arrested right now, and if you don't send in bail money, they're gonna be here and all this. So that individual uh, at this particular place, it seems, I don't know most people say, oh, there's no way I would ever fall for that. I hate to tell you, the reason they do it so much is so many people are falling for it. This gives you a chance to see some of these different things that they're placing against our senior adults. Anything else? Yes. Amen. All right, I want you to remember Dale Floyd uh, lost his father, Dale Floyd Sr., 
The wake will be tomorrow night. It will be at Mary Springs Church. Uh, you can support that family. Uh, they, so the wake's tomorrow night, and then the funeral is on Tuesday. It'll be uh, there'll be a, a wake from 10 to 11 on a Tuesday, and 11 o'clock the services for Dale Floyd Sr. Just remember that family as they're at the loss. And of course, there's been a lot of people who've lost family members. Remember, Brother Marcel, uh, he has been extremely sick. We've had a lot of people uh, that are on your prayer list in the back, but Brother Marcel is out of the hospital right now. But keep him in your prayers because he is uh, still um, having some symptoms of this. All right, let's praise the Lord. Amen. We're having our fifth Sunday singing. If you want to have sing a song special for us, we want you to come and do that for us tonight if you feel like getting up here and singing the specials. All right, let's sing, uh, Surely Goodness and Mercy Shall Follow Me All the Days of My Life. Let's stand together as we sing.
God, and we thank you for that, that you give us that hope this morning. We thank that you give us eternal hope this morning, Lord. Those that don't know you, Lord, may come to know you, Lord, this morning. Those that know you, Lord, and have turned away from Lord, we ask you that they will come back, Lord, to your presence, Lord, in their lives. Father, and I pray, Lord, those that walk, Lord, that you would still encourage us all, Lord, to walk, Lord, daily, holding your hand, Father. We just ask you, Lord, that you would move today. We ask you to be with us on service, Lord, that what we do and sing, Lord, would be praises to your holy name. Yes. And Father, I pray that you would be with Brother Blaine as he brings the word today, that, Lord, that you would fill him with your spirit, that he would prepare the message us all to hear, Lord. God, there's not one in this room today, Lord, that's exempt from hearing your word, yes. Lord. There's not one in this room, Lord, that can change a part in their life. Yes. And there's not yes. one in this room this morning, Lord, that doesn't need a touch from you, Lord. Thank you, Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace and your compassion. Go with us. Lead God and direct us. Most of all, Lord, forgive us where we failed you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 And our next hymn is the Old Rugged Cross. This is a good one. Let's all sing together. <laughs> truth in that song. Yes. All right, next, standing on the promises. This will be our offer to him. Let's stand together as we sing.
old grace of Jesus. That's a great old song. Brother Sadler was supposed to do a special for us this morning. He called me Friday and said that he was going to have a funeral service to conduct today. So uh, I dug one out. It's one that I haven't ever done here before. But I'm going uh, <coughs> I hope you'll enjoy it. It's uh, one that Kim had found somewhere on a computer or something other and she got the words for me and the music and I hope you'll enjoy it. I'm gonna try to do it. It's entitled Across the Bridge. It's uh talking about after you have become a Christian and across that river the light is a lot brighter. Once I lived a life of sin In this world I'm living in I had done forbidden things I shouldn't do Then I met a stranger on the way And asked him where's the place where I can find sweet happiness and love that's true. Across the bridge, there's no more sorrow. Across the bridge, there's no more pain. The sun will shine across the river. be unhappy again all the footsteps of the king till you hear the voices ring they'll be ringing out the glory of the land where the river of Jordan soon we'll see And the trumpet, Lord, we're going to hear And then we'll behold the most glorious face ever known to man Across the bridge, no more sorrow Across the bridge, there's no more pain the sun will shine across the river and we'll never be unhappy again. Across the bridge there's no more sorrow. Across the bridge there's no more pain the sun will shine across the river and we'll never be unhappy again and we'll never be unhappy again Thank you so much, Leslie. You know, a little bit small churches, we don't have, a, a, I guess you'd say, the different things some of the larger churches have because we're so dependent upon volunteers. And who wants to volunteer anymore? 
Who wants to volunteer anymore? I mean, haven't you noticed we don't even visit anymore? It's quiet. I ain't trying to get y'all depressed. I'm just trying to talk now. <laughs> haven't you noticed we don't spend time with each other anymore? Because we're busy. But have you ever thought about all that busy stuff we do? So I was looking at something. Actually, Tedra had placed it on that Facebook thing, and I, I, I noticed it the other day. And he was talking about an increase in depression. And, and what she had put on there, because this is a National Suicide Awareness Month, right? September's National Suicide Awareness. And uh, it seems kind of far set aside from you, but I'm telling you, you can see the symptoms. You can see the symptoms all the time. You know, there's a 37% increase in depression amongst, it's, 100%, it's 37% increase in depression amongst uh, teenagers. It's a 100% increase in suicide from ages, now listen to this, 10 to 14 years old. Now that seems far-fetched from everybody, doesn't it? Depression is a serious thing. We don't discuss it much, but it, it talks about it in the Bible. It actually talks about these things that, that are happening today. So when I look at it as a pastor, I see it from a perspective. But the most important perspective is as a Christian. So what you see going up is as our children are coming up, they're, they're exposed to things that a lot of us have never seen before. And the priorities, the priorities of our lives are reflected in our children. Now, I've been in places where, uh, and, and I can see it coming here, uh, where it's going to be nothing but traveling ball and different things that are taking place, and it sounds like a good thing, you know, because you'll hear people say, I just want to keep my family busy and keeps them away from drugs. Kind of like, you know, when we got into football, it's about, you know, I want to keep my kids away from, from drugs, and that's a good thing. I'm not saying it's bad. Here's the bad thing. The bad thing is, is when Christ is not the center of your family and your household. When Christ isn't the center, then our priorities become skewered. And it becomes skewered and, and it's reflected in how we do, how we even do practices and how we do ball teams, how we do life in general. Because we can become so busy and then we're wondering why. Why do we see all these things taking place around us? Because our priorities have become skewered. What really matters, what's really important. Your ancestors uh, didn't have near even close to the money that one individual makes today. Not even a percentage. And it's hard for people to understand that, you know, used to the, the, the biggest priority, Mama was telling me the other day about how her daddy had went around for a while just trying, uh, there'd be a layoff from the jobs and trying to find a job. And it couldn't be a fine, couldn't find a job. I said, well, Mama, what did y'all eat? She said, we ate what we placed up, what we had canned. Now, I want you to think about this, though, because there can be a time when them cans get fuel on the shelf. And all of a sudden, how would you deal with it? So in today's society, theirs was a relationship with Jesus Christ. And without Jesus Christ being in the center, all these other things are not going to support your life. So let's take a look in, in a, uh, this particular scripture in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4. I want to look at this, and, and we're going to use verses 1 through 13. So I want y'all to make sure that y'all read this. Because when you read this, a lot of times, we don't see ourselves in it. But I want you to just listen to this, this verse. If you'll stand with me as we read, if you're physically able, if you'll join me as we read God's holy word. Now, see, here, this is so important because God gave this for you for a specific reason. So all the laundry is hung up so you can see people uh, and, and you can see their difficulties. He said, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came and sat down under a juniper tree. Now, most of you know this story. If you don't, it's dealing with Elijah. And he, he's over there, and he had requested for himself that he might die. Now, I want you to picture this. Now, you, you maybe never experienced this before. You maybe never felt this before. You never, maybe you've never went through it. But I bet you somebody around you has. He felt like he wanted to die. He even requested from God. He said, Lord, just let me die. He says, it is enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I am not better than my father's. Let's just use that as our opening scripture. Father, we thank you so much for your word. I ask God that you would speak to our hearts, that you would use me as a vessel, Father, to proclaim the truth. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. 
So depression has become what they call all around now as an epidemic. And I told before in the church how when I lived in Missouri, there was a, it, was, it was over nine suicides over just a short year to period in teenagers. But it's not just teenagers. It happens in all, all age groups anymore. You, you see it all the time. And the reason it is is because so many people are going through depression and they cannot picture themselves getting out of it. Millions of people are going through a misery. And they feel hopeless. So some years ago, they had an article. It was a leading national magazine that says, there is no doubt that depression is the long-leading mental illness in the U.S. is now epidemic. So when you deal with it, you hear people all the time that are suffering from it. It's not a joke. It's not something that you take lightly. See, the Bible isn't silent about this particular subject. You see, Christianity is not just the pie in the sky kind of thing, situation, or philosophy. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Savior himself, who came to this old world and walked among mankind. So even in the Old Testament, there's these illuminating case studies. When I went to college, we used to have to do these case studies. And I'm not going to tell you it was my favorite subject matter. Because you would have to take an individual and it, it would have all, you, you would end up with a notebook about this thick and you would have to write all these case studies of how you're going to minister to them and everything else. And back then, you know, it was hard. I couldn't understand everything. I was living in Florida. I was in a foreign land and I was meeting a lot of different people. But the one thing it did show me is that there was a lot of hurts in this world. And there's a lot of people that are suffering from things and they don't know where to turn to. They don't know where to get their help from. So the Bible takes these, these Bible true stories right here, and it's revealed to us. He, he tells us about what's going on in somebody's life. You're seeing all of it on, uh, I hate to use it, but it would be a Facebook, but this is the true Facebook. See, this one has no lies in it. But all the laundry is hung out so that you can see it, so that you can know how God will deal with these situations. So Elijah, he's an example. He, he was, he's one of God's greatest prophets right here. We, we know from our Bible studies. And the, the moment of truth came in his ministry when he had met the 450 prophets of Baal, right? Satan himself right here. And they had a duel of prayer, basically, is what you can say. They both went on to this mountain, and they're all praying for God to show up. It was on Mount Carmel right here. And the pagans' prophets failed, but Elijah was victorious. So one of the greatest things that you take right here, when Elijah had succeeded in, in vindicating the name of Jehovah, uh, Yahweh, and Elijah's prophetic ministry that he was truly speaking for God. You say, well, man, this is, this is great right here. Elijah, he experienced his greatest spiritual victory that day. But the account doesn't stop there. And I believe this is what's so important because you may be someone who has served God all your lives and you've had great things take place and then something hits you, and you start feeling like a failure. So after this huge success, Elijah, he's exhausted. Now, this, this is the key right here when you read this particular story, is you see where he's just exhausted. He's drained. He's wore out. And he fell into this deep depression. Now, you can see some things, and, and it's a little bit different, like in football. I was telling somebody the other day, I said, you know, you can see these football teams, and they'll have this great big victory over a sp specific team, and then the next week, they play somebody, it's like a high school team, and all of a sudden, they get beat up because they had such a high, and now they're at such a low. They're just exhausted from everything they had went through before. So Elijah, what he does, if you look in verses 3 and 4, and then you, you look at verses 9 and 10. Let me read verses 3 right there. I'm going to read verse 3 if you don't mind. <coughs> if it's possible. It says, he was afraid and he arose and he ran for his life. And he came to Be Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. Now let's go down to verse 9. We're going to jump to 9 right here. And then he came there to a cave, and he lodged there. Now, don't you think about it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, watch this in verse 10. And he says, I have been very zealous for the Lord, 
the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left. I'm the last one. There is nobody else serving the Lord. There is nobody else. There's no other denomination. There's nobody who's praising and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just me. And I'm all by myself. And they seek my life to take it away. So if, if, if you ever seen this in one of your, maybe if you went to a high school course or maybe even a college course, Elijah, he's given some classic symptoms right here uh, of just this devastation that, that, that had precipitated by, by just emotional depression. He's going through these hurt. He's going through these heartaches. And we see Elijah, he's so fearful. And you see anxieties that are taking place right here. So this, you look at it, what do the depressed people do? How do, when you go through depression, and, and I hope you haven't, but if you ever have, what takes place? Often in life, when you go through depression, you feel so pessimistic about the future. You can hear it in churches. You say, what are we ever going to do? So many people have passed away, and, and, and how is it ever going to get any better? Who's going to take their place? It says in the Word that God sends in the workers, doesn't it? I'm not trying to beat up. I want you to think about it. See, God gives the answers in every situation. And what you're seeing is just that classic symptom of when fear starts coming into your life. And who's the author of fear? Satan himself. Who's the one who's the king of all liars? That's Satan himself. Who's the one who wants to get you discouraged and start hiding in a hole like a possum? Satan himself. So Elijah, he was taken on and he's looking at this and he's fearing for his life. And it appears that the greatest threat was already of, overcome when he had fought all them prophets of Baal. And when he had this, this great victory over 450. But why isn't it? Sometimes people look at other families and stuff and they say, well, why are they going through so much? I mean, they had, look, look at all the stuff that they possess. Look at where, where they've been at in their life. See, Elijah is just emotionally spent. He's overwhelmed. There's so many human experiences that, that, that take a toll in your life. You can lose somebody very special to you, a loved one, a husband, a wife, a child. You can lose somebody in your family, a friend or a neighbor that you grew up with. And all of a sudden you find yourself, to, your ability to cope with it is diminished. And that's why I believe sometimes the, the, where it says that the, the straw that broke the camel back, in other words, I can't take any more emotions, I can't take any more problems, I can't take any more stress, and it's that straw that makes you break down. And the reason is because we separate ourselves. Now, when you get emotionally overwhelmed in life and you start feeling like you've been tore down, what you see, it, it, you can see in people's lives where they start getting sick. When they're under stress all the time, when they're under so much or they have such a deep grief or stress from just a radical life changes that's taken place, all this can create in you a weariness. You can feel a physical exhaustion. Your, your spirit in which depression thrives on this stuff. Depression comes in and, and all you want to do is sleep or weep. So Elijah is feeling so blue. You ever feel blue? You ever feel beat up? You ever feel to that point where you say, like Elijah, I wish I were dead. The best of my days are over. You ever felt worthless, just worthless and that you serve no purpose anymore? And what it does is it starts getting you to consider your life unnecessary. Like it really doesn't matter. You serve no purpose anymore. And that's where Satan's dancing around and he's rejoicing. He's rejoicing. The richest times where, you know, you're, you're anxious to go to heaven. But why would the Lord let you tarry if you were up in age? Maybe it's because you're supposed to be praying for somebody else. Maybe you're supposed to be doing certain things that maybe nobody else can do. So Elijah's here in the, in the middle of this, this tragic heartache, and he seems to feel so guilty and ashamed because he's feeling tired. He feels wore out. He's ashamed that he's afraid. Here it is. He's seen this great victory, but he's still scared. We talk about it all the time. Matter of fact, we've used these exact scriptures before. But the thing you see with Elijah's life is he has this problem. 
He can't forgive himself from his failures. He can't forgive himself from, from he has human frailties. Isn't it a shame where we, we hold up people of such high esteem when all they are is human? If you put all your hope in me, you're, you're mistaken. See, the hope is in Jesus Christ. The hope is in God Almighty. The hope is, is in the promises of the word that he gives for all of us. But he looks at himself and it says in the word that if we go to God and, and, and we just repent, that he'll forgive us no matter what. Because I've had people say, I've done so many wrong things, I can never be forgiven. No, you're not that far. You haven't reached that place right here. He's just looking at his human frailties and saying, what a failure am I? Look at how many times I failed. Look at my mistakes in life. Look at my problems. You ever done that? You look at it and you see all the different difficulties you went through. So you can look and see the glass is either half empty or half full. So some of you notice that me and Brother Ellis um, blessed our wives many years ago. I'll get us in trouble with that. <laughs> he's looking at me, he's rolling his eyes already. So me and Brother Ellis uh, was married with our spouses on the same day. It's about four hours apart, right, Tedra? It's about four hours difference in when our ceremonies were done uh, at the same time. So we're, we're both been married 34 years. In those 34 years, I know what I've had to put up with. I don't know what you had to put up with. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. 34 years, you, you get a lot of water in the bridge. Sometimes it's rough water. Sometimes it can be bad water. But it's knowing that the water is going to keep flowing if you just hang on. That Jesus Christ has made you a promise. Some of you are out there and, and you, you <coughs> you're looking at all your failures or your frailties and, and you're seeing all these different things, and you don't realize that God can bring you out of this. So what Elijah did is what's it's a common thing is he started kind of indulging in a self-pity party. Depressed people, what they usually do is they don't need you to feel sorry for them. They don't need you to come over there and, and just, just help them feel depressed because they're already depressed. And they don't need to have the pity of their friends because they're having a pity party all by themselves. And they're just like Elijah saying, Lord, I'm such a failure. I'm such a mistake. And I've made so many mistakes. Now, one of the things you notice about Elijah, though, is he doesn't just keep it with himself. See, because when people go through depression, the first thing they start looking at is other people around them, and they start becoming really critical of others. And, you know, in the Scripture, it compares criticism as the same as crucifixion. It's considered the same as a crucifixion, and it, it's a really painful thing if you think about this right here. And Elijah becomes critical of other people, and he starts getting hostile. He starts getting angry. You know what? Depression involves that guilt, and it causes a self-depreciation of, of who you are. And that anger, what it does is it leads you to start criticizing everybody else. You start seeing all their failures. You start seeing all their faults. And if we're not careful, churches can be just like this. Churches, I'm talking about individuals now. Born again believers. We can start getting so angry. Why don't so and so do this? And why don't such and such? And we've never done it that way before. We start coming up with all this stuff and it's so much criticism. So what's God's prophet do right here? He goes over there and he finds him a cave to huddle in. What do you huddle in? He goes in there and I try to picture this and, and I picture it kind of like, you know, nowadays they talk about men caves and she shacks or something like that. They, they talk... <laughs> She sheds, she sheds. I'm trying to watch how I'm saying all this, I'm telling you. So he, he, he's, he's over there, and, and people get in these, these corners, these dark rooms, and, and they start hauling along, and they start praying to do what? I just wish I could die. And what do they do? All they want to do is sleep away the rest of their miserable, miserable life. Does it sound familiar? Now, here's the thing. Elijah's not alone right here. 
What you have to see when you read these scriptures, if you really want to be someone who sold out for Christ, start practicing what you study. Don't just memorize it. Look at what God's speaking to us. So while Elijah's in there and he's having a pity party and he's wanting to die, the God of all creation of the universe peers through all this darkness of the cave to see him. I kind of picture it myself. Is you ever look in a dark hole? You know, ever anybody ever go coon hunting or something like that? And you know, you're looking for that critter. Yo, y'all a bunch of city people. Everybody look like what? You get out there and you get in a big old holler log or something. That old dog tells you there's something up in this here log. You just don't know what the booger is up in that log. And you shine that light, and all you see is them big bug eyes looking back at you. And you ain't sure if it's a wild cat, a coon. Or even worse than all of it, a skunk, my greatest fear. And God looks in there, and his gaze penetrates all it. Because remember, we was talking about just Wednesday night, how the light of God illuminates everything else. And his gaze goes in there, and he sees this gloomy, depressed soul. And how many times when you see somebody mourning or going through grief or hurting their lives, how many times do you hesitate because you're like, ah, oh, and you don't even know why you're hesitating. You just don't want to be around that because it's hard, right? It's hard to be around someone who's going through depression, not God. See, that's the great thing about God. God doesn't just stand at the door. What he does is he cares about that individual and he acts. And he, he acts not only with love, but also with a firmness. See, what God does is he comes and he ministers to the need of Elijah at the time where he felt he was worthless. See, God has a therapy for each of us. Now, God, we know, he says, he knew us before we was formed in our mother's wombs. because He created all mankind, and he understands the workings of me. How my heart hurts, even when it's not explained scientifically. He understands that people go through these dark times. Now, here's the thing that's so important, though. God knows what you need. He knows your situation. So what happens is, it says that this angel comes and he, con he confronts Elijah and he gives him some, some specific therapeutic instructions that he was supposed to do. Elijah told him to, uh, told to, to perform a, a number of things so that he could get better. So the first thing that God, he, he says, you need to, tells him, he says, get up and take care of yourself. Because you ever notice when somebody goes through depression, how it creates a paralysis in your life? How you don't feel like doing and, and going, and it causes you to neglect some important things in your life. What Elijah had done is he had just stopped eating. And so what is, was he told to do? He says, go feed yourself. You ever see anybody who just stops eating? You ever see anybody who just stops? Well, as a pastor, I've seen it for years. So some depressed people, what they do is, is they get over there and they can medicate themselves with food also. You can see that by just stuffing, 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 eating, eating, eating useless calories. Other people, they starve themselves. So what that tells us, though, is that nutrition is so important in our lives, a, a part of the overcoming. So when God tells him, get up and go eat, it's something that matters. Seems simplistic, doesn't it? That doesn't seem like a shooting star, does it? That doesn't seem like the, the rainbow, but here's the truth. Why do we overlook it? See, depressed people, they often have to be encouraged to just go through that daily routine of life, like getting up a man and, and just saying, look, you just need to get up and shave because you're becoming lazy. You're becoming where you're not doing what you should. And what happens is the TV becomes a hypnotizing thing. You ever seen it? People just sit in front of the TV, and I'm not so sure that they're watching it, as it's just there, because they're not there anymore. So the person who speaks for God, you might have to say sometimes in, and to them, you need to get up. God's got a plan for you. You need to get up and do your chores. God's got a plan for you. But the whole situation, because I know what happens in your life, is you're understanding that you're taking a risk when you do it. But God has not called us to be fearful. He's called us to be courageous. And it's not just singing a bunch of songs about courageous. It's not just talking about it. It's being the hands and feet and voice for God. 
It's going in there even when people don't think they want you at that moment and giving them godly instructions. Now, some of you are saying, I could never do that. That's because you don't understand of letting God take control of your life. Letting God lead you. The reason we hide in fear out of every situation is because our relationship is not on fire with God. We want just enough of him to make us immune from the full amount of the Holy Spirit that God wants to pour out upon you. He wants to fill your cup to overflowing. We sing a song, till you drink from the saucer. But we want just enough to be in a comfort zone. So God told Elijah about the, this future ministry right here and, and, and the selection of his successor. Depressed people it, it need assignments to complete. They need tasks to get busy at. Accomplishments can reverse that downward spiral that Satan's trying to place people in. So when a person lacks that inner motivation right here, they may need some motivation from external sources. A good friend, a good brother, a good sister, someone who cares about them. It can happen to anybody. In my years of ministry, I've known multitudes of pastors and their wives and their children, deacons. I've known all sorts of people who hold positions that people say, well, how could they ever go through that? This is Elijah. Remember? The fire fell from heaven itself when he prayed and consumed all the altar, licked up the water. Let me tell you, it can happen to anybody. But the question is, is if the anybodies will say, Lord, I need your help. See, when we lack that, that inner inner motivation a lot of times we won't discipline ourselves to do what god has called us to do you can see it even in the church we don't see a need to go visit anybody anymore you don't see a need to go visit somebody who's lost a loved one or someone in a hospital or someone in a nursing home or someone else you see you're important and sometimes if you're not careful, Satan has convinced you that you're not. See, we, we see Elijah meeting God in a whole new way right here in these scriptures. Elijah hears that, that still, small voice. And you know what he's speaking to him? He's speaking to him love and forgiveness. See, that's what a lot of people need to hear. That no matter where they've been at in life, no matter how many times they think they've failed, that God can forgive them. You shouldn't give yourself excuses to say, well, I'm just human. But you should understand that God is more than able to forgive you no matter what you've been through and the failures of your life. Depressed people, what they need to be is reminded of that God is still present with them. And so many times we feel so unworthy, we feel so like trash that we want to throw ourselves out the window. But the great thing is, is that me and you have been called to be pickers up of trash. That don't sound good, does it? Picker uppers. <laughs> yeah, picker uppers. That don't sound good. See, God is still present with you. And when he's doing, he's sending people, hopefully in the name of Jesus Christ, to help pick you up, to encourage you. He has a, a word for you. So many people go through things because they never get under the, the teaching of the Bible. And one of the hard things is here is a lot of times in the smaller churches, a lot of your workers are picking up and they're doing so much, and they're not getting preached to. They're not getting to hear that gospel message. And that's why I'm hoping this team kids with these divided up crews, that more and more people can get up under the word of God. See, you don't only need to teach, you need to be preached to also. It's real. The gospel message is real for all people who listen. Now, what we see in the scripture here is how Elijah, with all this, has become healthier. And what happens is he begins to understand and he accepts his own humanity, his own frailties. You know, Peter went out there and walked with Jesus and denied Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. You know, Peter could have went out there and just went off and went into his own cave. 
He could have got by himself. And no one would be the rock to start preaching that word. A lot of times, me and you say, my, my position or my place isn't necessary. And sometimes you don't even see a need for help. Our doctors have prescribed so much medication anymore that that becomes the first alternative. And some people do need something because of there's a, a chemical imbalance. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is there's so much more to it spiritually. See, God has made help available if we just understand. Now, see, right here, there were 7,000 people of God who had not been a knee to the prophet of Baal. 7,000. But he thought he was all by himself. A lot of times people feel like they're all by themselves. They haven't become grounded enough in the word of God. And they don't understand that God's there for them. You have so many false prophets today. You have so many that are out there that espouse and, and, and they, they, they teach just a little bit about Jesus, but they're not teaching the whole gospel message. See, Elijah had to come along and he had to see that he needed help. So how many of you, and I've asked this dozens of times, are willing to ask for help? Now, don't all raise your hand up at one time. Don't you hate it? Don't you have to hate it that you would have to say that you need help? That you can't do it by yourself? Don't you hate it? You know, one of the hardest things for me as a pastor is because people wait till it's too late before they ask for help. I told you the other day, you know, we, we buried somebody I grew up with. He had the symptoms going on for weeks, months before he went to a doctor. It was months because he's going to get through this. It's just a stomach virus. That's all it was. It's just a stomach virus. And it goes on and goes on and he finally goes and he discovers that he had a cancer. In less than 40 days, he was dead. The question is, is we do this, or maybe the statement is, we do this in our own lives and other circumstances. We have the symptoms of different things, of hurts and needs in our lives, but we can't go and tell somebody that we need help. And a lot of times, even as the people of God, we, we kind of shun away from people that have problems. But I'm telling you, we have been called to be courageous, to go into the darkness with the light of Jesus Christ. The, de the depressed people that refuse to accept help are just unrealistic. God can help and will help if people will just say, I need help. He says he won't turn away from you. He says he won't reject you. I've seen so many problems with people in in Missouri, they had, there was multitudes of suicides. And I couldn't understand it. But the more I look at it, it's because we've grown so distant to God. We don't study anymore. We don't go to the Sunday school Bible studies. Or we say, this teacher's born. Listen, there's more than one class. We don't get into the Word and understand that He sees you in your cave. And he says, I'm going to help you. I'll help you. But God's not going to force himself upon you. He's a gentleman. We have not because we ask not. If you could bow your heads for just a moment. As they're coming down to do an altar call, let me ask you where you're at. First, you have to begin with the spiritual order. If you've never given your heart to Christ, truly, truly given your heart to Christ, that's the first step. Repent and be ye saved. After that, there's other needs in your life. Hurts, pains, depressions. You say, I, I, I just can't stand it. And you, you've, you've, you've had it so long, you, you, you're disgusted to look at it. Because you say you've developed your own way of handling it but it raises its head up every now and then. 
Won't you ask God to help you? Help me, Lord. I'm hurting. I feel like a failure. He won't turn away from you. These altars are open. If you need to come and make a decision for Christ, I'm inviting you right now. This is your opportunity. I'm inviting you. Won't you give your life to Jesus? It don't matter what age you are. The oldest one I baptized was 88 so far. And I can take a 100-year-old too. All it takes is a heart for Christ. Won't you come this morning as they play? Would you dismiss us in prayer, please?